Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions, a teaching center dedicated to excellence and skills enhancement in San Dimas, California. And it's great to spend a few minutes with you today because we're going to talk about the MOD preparation for amalgam. Take a look at uh, my channel and if there's some things in there you'd like to see, just let me know. I want to try to make it work for everybody, uh, give you as many demos as I possibly can. I uh, love your feedback. Let's get into this particular preparation by starting with some pre-prep planning. We're going to use the Columbia type it on for this particular preparation and I think it's important to identify the locations of the mesial, central, and distal pits and draw a little line across them so you can get an idea of what the outline form is going to look like and run that right down the middle of the tooth buccolingually to the contact area. And we're going to want to extend the preparation into the buccal groove and also into the distal lingual groove area. So uh, the basic outline form can be planned by looking at the tooth a little bit ahead of time and deciding on where you're going to put your burr. We want to know also where the extensions are going to be uh, approximately. So I'd like to sort of think about how far the boxes are going to have to be extended buccolingually to achieve clearance. So I'm going to just go ahead and cut forward here and show you what this tooth would look like after I've filled it in to give you an idea of the outline form. And it'd look about like this. Uh, this is sort of where you're going to want to have your burr restricted to. Uh, and gives you an idea of what the prep is going to look like. There is going to be a little tricky area there between the distal lingual groove and the distal box and you'll get to see how we work that out in the final preparation. So let's get started with the occlusal preparation. And for this step we're going to want to start with a 330 burr measures 1.6 millimeters and this will give us a good idea of our depth. This is just a punch cut that we'll want to place in the central fossa area and it should be 1.5 millimeters deep. It's pretty important to try to get the burr all the way to full depth rather than playing around with a very conservative preparation you end up making it wider as you go deeper. We would like to get the depth right down there from the very beginning and you can see that we're really close to getting that 1.5 and then we're going to just push the burr towards the mesial trying to maintain the same depth leave a little shell on the mesial and then we're going to push the burr towards the distal uh, and the, in the same particular manner that we've been doing, keeping the handpiece perpendicular to the occlusal table at all times and thinking about how those cusps are providing you with information that you want to follow uh, for how to hold the handpiece on this particular tooth. And so we just made a little slit mesial distally and this slit is uh, clearly not going to be the final outline form. We're just using this almost to give you a, uh, the initial boundaries, if you will, of the burr and uh, a starting point from which to work. And then, of course, we're going to push the burr about a millimeter up into the buccal groove, and then we're going to go about a millimeter into the lingual groove as, as well, this little distal lingual groove area. And we're going to tip the burr a little bit distally in this area to follow the fact that there's a slight distal inclination to the tooth in that location. You can see that this initial slit and extension into the lingual and buccal areas has been completed. We obviously are going to need to smooth the pulpal wall as we progress further. I like to take the 330 now and just extend the burr a little bit towards the facial lingual in the box areas. And I'm not really shaping anything. I'm just kind of getting the, the basic starting point for the next burr uh, situated. So I, I can see that I've got a little slit that goes buccolingually that I'll be using for my 245 burr when I start to drop the proximal boxes. I don't think it's a good idea at all to make an S-curve at this point or to extend out this area buccolingually too much uh, thinking about the final outline form because we really don't know what that outline form is going to look like until we've determined where the boxes end up going. 
it's always better to get your boxes completed before you go back and develop your S-curves. And you'll see that, uh, I think, demonstrated uh, later on in the video. So let's go ahead and get started with the dropping of the proximal boxes. And for this, we're going to want to use the 245 carbide. And we're going to utilize that in a really straightforward manner by just pushing the bird down. And you have to remember that there's a lot of room, a wiggle room, for dropping the burr. You can go significantly far down the preparation uh, towards the gingival and not be too fearful of uh, dropping it too far. You can also keep the burr significantly further away from the adjacent tooth than maybe you thought because you have this large zone that you can work within, and particularly considering the fact that the burr is only 0.8. So always look at the tooth from the side and get an idea of where your boxes are going to end up going in order to achieve the appropriate amount of gingival clearance, which is usually 0.5 millimeters or a little bit more. So you can see that now we're, we're dropping the box and we can do it with confidence to the full depth of the flutes without worrying about going too far gingivally. And we can also keep the burr away from the adjacent tooth and never hit the adjacent tooth. Uh, to uh, by creating this little shell. Now, when you're dropping the box, remember to lean the burr towards the facial when you're preparing the lingual wall to create the convergency of the functional cusp and upright when you're working on the facial wall, the non-functional cusp side. We don't want both walls to be convergent. We just want the convergency to be established from the functional cusp side, in other words, the lingual side of this particular tooth. And this is uh, how we do it. Uh, we get these initial little sort of oval shaped uh, areas that we've dropped interproximally to the full depth of the 245 burr flutes, which is three millimeters. And now we can pick up a hand instrument and chip this area away. So I like using the 10614 enamel hatchet. This is the original GV black instrument and we can just just teeter-totter that a little bit mesial distally and just ch chip that little area away and you can see me do this again on the distal. It's just a great way to kind of avoid hitting the adjacent tooth and to know that you haven't gone too far gingerly. So it's, it's a decent, safe way to do this. Now we're going to turn our attention to removing these little C-shaped bird beaks that you can see on the facial lingual of both mesial and distal boxes. And if you cannot get the instrument in very easily, you need to deepen the axial wall. You need to go more towards the pulp more axially. I need to widen the gingival before you can put the instrument here because you don't want to push the instrument down and scrape that little premolar or do you want to uh, scrape the uh, molar working on the distal. Remember to keep the hatchet uh, in situated so that the flat end is towards the wall you're cutting. The bevel should be away from you at all times and we can just go ahead and chip these little areas away. The instrument has got to be absolutely sharp. You better start with a new one. And when you're chipping, always maintain a 90 degree exit angle. Don't turn the instrument in any way that would be uh, in violation of what we're trying to accomplish, which is a 90 degree exit at all times. Even when you're underextended, like we are on the distal lingual, we want to maintain that angle properly. Uh, I'm just deepening the axial wall now. That doesn't mean going more gingival, that means I'm pushing the burr more distally to increase that dimension. You can see I'm going to do that here on the distal as well. I'm just pushing the burr over into the corner and then I'm also undermining this area because this is an underextended area. And this is how we do it. We just undermine that lingual wall and create a bird beak on purpose that we will be able to chip away quite easily with a very sharp enamel hatchet. If you don't know how to sharpen an enamel hatchet, you can check out my little uh, YouTube video on sharpening instruments. Or uh, if you're in a, a tough situation where you just need a razor sharp brand new one, then get a new one, uh, whatever it takes. I mean, the, the cost of instruments is relatively cheap compared to the cost of having to uh, take an exam over again. I've always felt that, you know, people say education is expensive, but uh, ignorance is far more expensive. <laughs> So we want to do the best we can with the best instruments and whatever that takes. 
the RGS1 now can be used at this point to see how we're doing. Are we breaking contact enough? And, you know, it's pretty conservative and on distal lingual, not quite enough. I think we're probably going to need to extend these outline, the outline form a little bit more in all areas. So here we can, you can see I've done a little bit more extension and uh, I think the mesial extension uh, falls within that 0.3 to 0.5 range. The distal is too tight on the lingual distal lingual side, so we're going to work on that just a little bit more. Uh, the, the hand instrument is great to use if you know how to use it, and I think that if you watch enough of my videos, you'll get to figure out how to use this instrument, but I'm going to throw in a little diagram here and show you how to use the secondary cutting edge, and this comes out of uh, one of my little uh, clinic manuals that I provide for my students, but we want to think about utilizing the instrument in two different orientations when we're trying to make a line angle. And then we also want to keep in mind that we can use the secondary cutting edge to slide along the axial wall to deepen it and reshape it really effectively. It's a great way to deepen the axial wall, like right here, without having to put a burr back in there. You know, we are, we're always in those situations where we're just trying to get just another tenth of a millimeter. And, you know, not very much. And the last thing we want to do is put a burr in there and make some kind of mistake, like go too deep axially or maybe hit the adjacent tooth. So let's take a minute here to clean off the tooth. You can use a little bit of Windex and a toothbrush uh, on the type it on. Obviously in the patient's mouth, we'd be using water and air spray. But we want to kind of clean it up a little bit and kind of uh, get an idea where things are going, how it looks. And I think we're looking pretty good. Uh, we have decent boxes. Uh, the pulpal depth is good. The extensions into the grooves look pretty good. Or maybe a little tight there in the distal lingual. But uh, otherwise looks pretty decent. The problem is that the outline form is uh, inadequate. Those are the RGS3s just being used to measure the axial depth and then looking at the isthmus a little bit narrow. So, and we want to round off that little sharp edge there. So all of these things can be accomplished pretty uh, easily with a burr called the 330 RGS, which is the next thing we're going to be utilizing. So refinement really begins with the burr. And the burr of choice for us is this 330 RGS. It's just a phenomenal instrument. It's recently invented and it took over a year to develop this burr. It's made out of a single piece of uh, carbide steel rather than having the tip brazed on or welded on. It's a single piece, so it's a very strong burr. It's two millimeters in length, and it has a slightly sharper flat bottom than a 330 burr, so it allows you to maintain the convergency of the occlusal area and yet sharpen the line angles uh, slightly to make it a little bit crisper looking. We don't want to have razor sharp line angles on an amalgam, and definitely not on a composite, but making them a little cleaner is uh, highly, highly recommended. And you'll, this burr is uh, a magical thing because it will cover the entire axial walls of the preparation and uh, make them very smooth like you can see here uh, while maintaining the convergency. This, this preparation was done, uh, the smoothing part was done entirely with that 330 RGS. I think that uh, dental schools are going to start to pick up on the importance of this burr and will be recommending it in their burr blocks in the future but it's going to take a few years for the word to get out. Uh, it's uh, something that we've been using at our center for uh, several months now. So uh, we're just uh, doing a little cleanup work here with a 10714 enamel hatchet. You can see there's a bevel there. There's also a bevel down at the gingival that I placed with a GMT. I'll go over that again just to make sure that you can see the way we hold the instruments. But the outline is looking pretty smooth. Uh, you know, no sharp areas. Uh, anything that is rough and irregular, we want to remove it at this particular uh, step. And uh, it's pretty, pretty much uh, almost completed. So let me throw in the uh, little example of the GMTs. Here it is. Um, so you can see how we're using that to make the bevel. We start in the middle of the axial uh, pulpal area and we go towards the side. Then we flip the instrument around and then uh, go from the middle to the other side. And you can put a slight, maybe 20 degree declination angle to half of that uh, wall on the, the gingival. 
And same thing over here. We'll start in the middle and we'll just twist the instrument over towards the lingual to create a little 0.3 millimeter axopulpal bevel, a little rounding. And once again, start in the mesial, uh, in the mesial box right in the middle and then work towards the, uh, the facial. And then we can also go over that gingival just a little bit more if we, if we want to. So there is that little move that you make. It doesn't take a lot of effort. It's pretty simple, really. At this point, I think it's a good idea to kind of measure things. An RGS-3 is one millimeter. We're looking at axial depth of 1.2 to 1.4. The pulpal depth is uh, 1.5. The width should be a little bit more than one. Here's the uh, RGS-1, which is 1.5, showing you that the depth is right where it should be. And we're a little bit less than the RGS-1, so our, our clearance is probably 0.25 uh, on that distolingual and maybe 0 0.35, 0 0.4 in the other areas. And, and that to me would be acceptable. If you wanted to extend that distolingual a little bit more, that wouldn't be a bad idea. I'm going to take the tooth out of the typonaut and show you the convergency of the functional side on the left and the straight up and down or the 90 degrees relative to the gingival on the facial side. We can kind of take a look at the details of the preparation. Uh, once again, looking at the convergency on the lingual side and the straight up and down or the 90 degrees relative to the gingival on the facial side. Uh, and uh, it turned out okay. I think it's a, it's a decent preparation. Uh, clearly not perfect. I've never made a perfect prep in my life and I don't think I ever will, but I'm gonna keep trying. <laughs> anyway, this is the, uh, the result that we had today and I think that it should give you a pretty good idea of what this prep should look like. So as always, thanks for spending a few minutes. Uh, please subscribe, give me feedback, love to hear from you, and keep at it. I'll keep at it too. All the best.